So today's video is going to be another solved true crime case. Today is part two of the Joanna Dennehy case. That's right, this is a part two, so if you haven't caught part one yet, I will link it up here in the eye. You kinda need to watch that one first, otherwise this one won't make any sense. I said that wrong. I won't make any sense and neither will this video. So yeah, watch part one first and then come back here for part two and then we'll get into the rest of the case together. All that being said, I would just like to thank our sponsor for making this video possible, Time Princess. Time Princess is a fun little interactive novel game and a 3D dress up game all in one. I've always loved games like this where it's kind of a story and the choices that you make in the story affect the outcome that you get. So the game is so unique to you and in Time Princess you get to experience so much. Different cultures, different time eras, different places around the world, including a world of crime and conspiracies. In Time Princess you get to be whoever you want to be, wherever you want to be. You could walk the foggy streets of London and uncover ancient secrets of black magic and vampires. Or you could be a famous opera singer who is now left solving the mystery of a dark phantom that is haunted the opera house. And all of these unique settings and time periods all come with different outfits for you to dress your character in and I'm actually a little bit jealous of my character at the moment. She has so many nicer outfits than me. I want to live in the game. And right now, Time Princess are actually giving away $7,000 in Sephora gift cards and there's two ways for you to win. Click the link down below in the description to download Time Princess and the three highest players in the clothing collection rank will win a $500 Sephora gift card each. But that's not all because Time Princess are literally just choosing random players that play the game to win a $500 Sephora gift card. So there's never been a better time to download the game. Remember you can download Time Princess using the link down below in the description of this video for the chance to win $7,000 in Sephora gift cards. And each new player will actually receive a $200 Time Princess gift pack when you download the game as well. So many reasons to start playing now. Thank you again to Time Princess for sponsoring this video. Quickly before we carry on with the rest of the case I do just want to give the same content warnings that I gave in part one. This case does involve a lot of heavy themes from child neglect to domestic abuse, sexual assault. There's also mention of self-harm and suicide attempts in this video so if any of that is something that you don't feel like you can watch right now please click out of this video and look after yourself. That is the most important thing. I'm sure I'll see you again over here at some point with a different case that's maybe a little bit more suitable for you. But until then, keep smiling, look after yourself. So I'm just gonna give you a quick little summary of part one and then we'll flow straight into part two of this case. Kevin Lee was a 48 year old lettings agent from Peterborough and on March 30th, 2013, he was found murdered. His body was found laying in a field in the middle of nowhere, dressed up in a woman's sequin dress and posed in a way that was certainly intended to humiliate him. Police have managed to work out that two hardened criminals were with him on the day that he died. Their names were Joanna Dennehy and Gary Richards, whose nickname is Stretch. But it seems that both Joanna Dennehy and Gary Stretch have gone on the run and police have no idea where they are. Detectives went and searched Joanna Dennehy's home and there they found a mattress covered in blood. Although that blood actually didn't match Kevin Lee. It wasn't a match to the murder victim. Could it be possible that Joanna Dennehy, if she was Kevin's murderer, did she have another victim as well? And this was even more worrying when police found out that Joanna's housemate, John Chapman, was missing. No one could get hold of him. No one knew where he was. It seemed that wherever Joanna was going, she was leaving a trail of mystery and devastation in her wake. And police knew they needed to find her now. So a full scale manhunt was launched to try to find Joanna Dennehy and Gary Stretch. So police felt that the best way for them to do this was to actually get the public involved because right now they had no leads on either of them. They had no idea where to even start looking for them. So police went and posted Joanna's and Gary's faces over every single news channel, newspaper that they possibly could. Their faces were everywhere in the hopes that any member of the public might see them out and about, recognize them from the appeals, and then call the police and give them in. And police had a lot of hope in this because let's be honest, both Gary and Joanna were very 
distinctive, unique looking people. There weren't many people around that looked like these two. Joanna had face tattoos, Gary Stretch was seven foot tall. I mean, how often do you see a duo walking around like that? And a few days into this investigation, police got their first lead. And this came in the form of a phone call from a different police force. Norfolk police had called them believing that they were also looking into Joanna Dennehy and Gary Stretch but for a different crime. It turned out that the two of them had driven to a petrol station in Joanna's car, Gary was driving while Joanna jumped out, ran into the petrol station, grabbed loads of food, loads of drinks, and then ran straight out. She stole all of it, jumped back in the getaway car, and the two of them sped away. It was actually Joanna's face tattoo that these police officers in Norfolk recognised when they saw all these appeals on the news. And so they felt that it would be useful for Norfolk police and Peterborough police to work together on this. Luckily, the petrol station had pretty good CCTV footage from this incident. And that's how they knew that they were looking for Joanna and Gary. And the car, they could see the car, the license plate, everything. And this was a huge, huge break for the case. The fact that they now had Joanna Dennehy's license plate, the car that these two were in. And because they had this license plate number, they could now use license plate recognition technology on all the cameras on all the motorways in the UK to track this car, to trace where they were traveling. So police went and input this license plate number into the system and it brought up a location. Well, quite a few locations that they'd been seen at over the last couple of days. And it was very clear that Gary Stretch and Joanna Dennehy were heading southwest. In the car that Kevin Lee had bought Joanna Dennehy, or at least given her the money for, out of the kindness of his own heart. 72 hours after Kevin's body was found, Joanna Dennehy and Gary Stretch were also seen at a service station stealing more things and then getting back in the car and running away. By April 2nd, 2013, Joanna and Gary had been on the run now for maybe about four or five days and they were running out of money. They were trying to operate mainly on a cash basis because obviously if the second they used a debit card or a credit card, the police would have an instant location on them and they would be right there. And they were running out of cash. And so Gary Stretch thought up a plan to get them over this. That afternoon, they went to a shop and they robbed loads of different electronics, like phones, I don't know, electronics. They got back in the car, obviously sped away. They were on the run now because they'd robbed the shop. And Gary told Joanna that he had this friend in Hereford. Well, it wasn't so much a friend. It was actually just someone that he'd met in prison. And then as soon as the two of them left prison, they never spoke again. They hadn't been in contact in years. So it wasn't a friend. But you know, desperate times, desperate measures. He knew this guy in Hereford and that was relatively close to where they were. So he was like, right, we can go to my friend's house. This guy's name was Mark Lloyd and Mark Lloyd used to be a petty thief. He would steal people's phones and laptops, things like that. And so Gary Stretch knew that Mark Lloyd had connections that were willing to buy stolen goods. And what did Gary and Joanna have a whole lot of? stolen electronics now. This was all part of his plan. They were gonna steal all this stuff. He was gonna get in touch with an old friend and then find these connections that would buy it all off them. So then they would have cash to stay on the run. So Gary drove the two of them all the way to Mark's house in Hereford. And he was very surprised to see them. Obviously he hadn't heard from Gary in over a year now. The two of them, Gary and Joanna, literally just barged straight into Mark's house. He didn't have a say in this. He didn't know what was going on, why they were there. They barged straight in, went into his kitchen, laid down all these electronics on the side, told him the situation and asked for his connections. And before he even had a chance to respond, Joanna Dennehy pulled a knife out of her pocket and threatened Mark Lloyd saying, I've just killed three people. I wanna kill someone. Mark said that he was very, very intimidated by Joanna, not even just after this incident, cause I think anyone would be intimidated by someone waving a knife in their face saying they wanna kill them. But even before that had even happened, he said that the second he saw Joanna, he was a bit scared of her. Like she just had this 
energy about her, threatening energy. And it's something that a lot of people have said about Joanna Dennehy. I think it's one of the ways that she always just got what she wanted in life. She was good at manipulating people and people were scared to say no to her. She was always in control of everything. She was always manipulating everyone around her. Even Gary Stretch, actually. Mark said that Joanna had Gary wrapped around her little finger. Anything she said, anything she wanted, Gary was gonna do it, no questions asked. Even just think back to her previous relationship with John Chapman, she would cheat on him, she would abuse him, all this kind of stuff, but he would stay with her. This woman just seemingly had this indescribable control over men that was just really hard for them to pinpoint why they were so drawn to her. She was often described as having a spell over people, which I think describes it very well. But her to even have this spell on Gary Stretch, who is like a seven foot tall, very, very physically strong man, if he didn't ever wanna do anything with Joanna, he could so easily overpower her. He was never in danger when he was with this woman, but for some reason, he just did anything and everything for her. I think it just really shows how powerful Joanna was in these dynamics, that it doesn't matter who it is, she's controlling them. So anyway, they're all in Mark Lloyd's house and they've just told him about their plan. They want these connections. They wanna sell all these electronics. But at this point in time, Mark Lloyd had actually put his life of crime behind him. And so he wasn't very comfortable with this situation. And I think Joanna and Gary could tell that about Mark, that he was quite hesitant to help them out with this. And so Gary Stretch lifted his shirt and revealed a handgun in the waistband of his trousers. This was like a threat to Mark. He didn't even have to say anything to Mark. That was enough. Just showing him that he had a gun. Mark was thinking, oh my God, okay, I'm on board. So Mark just did as he was told. He just went out to the car, sat in the back seat, Gary Stretch got in the driver's seat, Joanna in the passenger seat, and they went. They were gonna go and sell these electronics. And Mark said that on this car journey, I think they were driving for about 45 minutes in total, and Mark said that Joanna was just getting weirder and weirder as the journey went on. She was playing with that knife that she'd threatened Mark with in the house. She was just playing with it. She was just flipping it about. She was chugging whiskey from the bottle. She was singing, she was dancing. She was just having a great time. And that was when Joanna Dennehy pulled this camera out of her bag. Now this camera, she and Gary Stretch had been carrying this around the whole time they'd been on the run and they'd been snapping pictures the whole time, like it was nothing. There's pictures of them everywhere. There's pictures of her holding the knife. There's pictures of them two just messing about on some balcony somewhere. And then Joanna Dennehy snapped this picture of Mark Lloyd in the back of their car while they were on the run. She kept trying to offer him whiskey all the way through this car journey and he didn't even really want any. It was the middle of the day, but he kept drinking it because it was Joanna and he was scared to say no to her. He was doing whatever he thought he needed to do to cause as little trouble as possible. And so he put back like half a bottle of whiskey with her. He said it was a wonder he never threw up because he was drinking so much. It was straight from the bottle and Joanna had no problem with this. Remember, she used to drink like two liters of vodka a day. She was always so drunk at all times. And Mark said that Joanna was just getting more and more excitable and agitated and energetic as this car journey was going on until eventually she told Gary Stretch to stop off so that they could go and get some cigarettes. When they got there, Joanna got out of the car, but she didn't wanna go alone. And so she told Mark Lloyd to come in with her and he was gonna be the one to buy the cigarettes, not her. They didn't have any cash, remember? So they walked into this corner shop together and he was the one that was supposed to do all the talking, all the buying, and she was just gonna stand with him. And there's actually CCTV footage of this in the shop where Joanna's kind of coming up behind Mark, she's cuddling him from behind. They look really coupley in this footage, but the reality of this CCTV footage was not that Joanna was hugging him. She wasn't being nice to him by any means. She was holding the knife against his back. Not the blade, the handle of the knife, just to remind him that she had it. And this was so that Mark wouldn't pull anything while they were in the shop, so that he wouldn't tell the cashier what was going on or what she was making him do. He wouldn't try and run away, anything like that. She was making sure that he stayed in check with that. And Mark remembered being stood there in that store, so scared, thinking, what is she gonna do 
in here? Is she going to try and rob the store? Is she going to assault the woman that's serving them? Is she going to try and rob the, the cash register? But then, interestingly enough, Joanna chose not to do any of that. And instead, she started flirting with the woman in the shop like the cash register woman. It seemed that she liked this woman. She found her attractive and so she was lucky. This woman had a lucky escape that day and she never even knew it. So they got the cigarettes and then they went and got back in the car and continued driving to wherever they were headed. And at this point, Joanna's energy was still building and building and building and now it was at a boiling point. Like she couldn't sit still. Something needed to be released from her. She turned to Gary Stretch and said, I want my phone now. Find me a victim, find me a victim. No women or children. Gary spotted a man on the other side of the road and pointed to him and said, will he do? And Joanna looked over and said, yes. This man was 64 year old Robin Baretza, a retired firefighter who was just walking his dog down the road that day, minding his own business. And he was actually quite close to home now. So he'd been on this walk and he was on his way back. He was almost there. Joanna told Gary Stretch to pull over and stop the car. And he did. Joanna jumped out and approached Robin Baretza. She approached him from behind. So Robin had no way of knowing what was about to happen to him. Joanna pulled the knife from her pocket, swung it in the air and plunged it straight into Robin Baretza's back. Robin said that it actually felt as though he'd been punched. He didn't think he'd been stabbed. He thought someone was trying to fight him or rob him or something. And so he got up and turned round to see what was going on. As he did, Joanna was still holding the knife in front of him and it actually caught his arm and slashed his arm. As soon as he realised what was going on, this woman was standing there with a knife. He tried to fight her off. He tried to defend himself but it wasn't enough. She was just way too strong. And she had a knife. This was never gonna be a fair fight when one person has a weapon. And Joanna took that weapon and plunged it again into Robin Baretz's shoulder this time. And with that, Robin collapsed to the floor. Meanwhile, Gary Stretch and Mark Lloyd are sitting in the car. They've just witnessed this whole thing. They've just witnessed Joanna walking up and attacking this man from behind. He is defenseless. It came out of nowhere. She literally just picked a victim from the street, got out of the car and went and stabbed them. And Gary Stretch was used to this by now. I mean, he knew Joanna, he knew what she got up to in her spare time. But Mark Lloyd had no idea who this woman was. And now he was witnessing her attempting to murder a random innocent civilian. He was horrified. So Mark was saying, oh my God, we've got to go and help him. We've got to stop her. But Gary just locked the doors and told him not to bother. They were arguing back and forth for a while. Mark couldn't believe that Gary was enabling this, facilitating this, not letting him go and stop it. But then Gary just turned to Mark Lloyd and said, there's nothing you can do. You've just got to let her do her thing. When Joanna was done attacking this innocent man, she ran back to the getaway car jumped in the passenger seat, gave Gary Stretch a kiss on the cheek, and they sped away. Joanna Dennehy had attempted to murder Robin Baretza, and now she was just leaving him on the side of the road for dead. Just to put this into perspective for you, this was on the side of a road. Remember, they were driving in this car when they spotted Robin Baretza, so this wasn't some kind of you know, isolated, abandoned place that no one was. This was the middle of the day. It was 3 p.m., broad daylight. The middle of the day, Joanna just found someone on the side of the road, went and stabbed them. She didn't care who saw. She was so reckless. She was so shameless as well. Meanwhile, Robin was left in a pool of his blood on the floor with potentially fatal injuries and he was just bleeding out. He couldn't stand up. He couldn't crawl. He couldn't get any kind of help. Luckily, he was found by a member of the public who was able to call an ambulance and get him to hospital and he did survive his injuries, although they were very, very severe. The first stab wound in his back had actually fractured one of his ribs and caused a bleed in one of his lungs, which if he hadn't have been found when he did, 
it would have probably killed him. The second stab wound that was in his shoulder completely shattered his shoulder blade and fractured his humerus, which is this bone here. And it was actually also a miracle that this stab wound on his shoulder hadn't severed the nerves in his arm because if it had, his whole arm would have potentially been paralyzed for the rest of his life. Robin Baretza was left severely injured and severely traumatized as well, but he survived. He made a relatively good recovery as well, considering how horrid his injuries actually were. But Robin Baretza wouldn't actually be Joanna's only victim that day, because as soon as she jumped back in the car, within five minutes of them being back on the road, she was already looking for another victim. It was immediately on her mind. As soon as she jumped back in the car from attacking Robin Baretza, she turned to Gary Stretch and said, I want to do some more. And Gary knew exactly where to take her to do some more. Because Gary's grandmother had actually lived in Hereford when he was young and so he knew all the kind of quieter, dog walker kind of spots, the exact kind of victim that Joanna Dennehy wanted. I don't know for what reason she never wanted to kill women or children, but she was looking for someone exactly like Robin Baretza, someone that was more of a middle-aged man, just out walking his dog, minding his business, and Gary took her to a place where she could find exactly that. They drove for a few more minutes until Gary eventually spotted another man on the side of the road. Again, he pointed and said, what about him? This time it was 56 year old John Rogers. He was walking his dog down a cycle path alone that day. There was no one else around. And Joanna said, yep, him. And so once again, Gary Stretch pulled over the car so that Joanna could jump out and go and approach John Rogers. Again, she approached her victim from behind, and so John Rogers, much like Robin Baretza, had no idea what was about to happen to him. He was completely defenseless when Joanna Dennehy lifted the same knife that she'd used to stab her last victim, and she drove it into John Rogers' back multiple times, over and over and over. This time, it was like something had possessed her. She only stabbed Robin Baretza twice, whereas this time she couldn't stop. It was like something came over her. She was stabbing him and stabbing him in the back until eventually he collapsed to the ground, but she wasn't done there. She got down on the floor next to him, grabbed him, pulled him over onto his back. So now he was facing upwards. He could see his attacker's face and she just continued. She was doing the exact same thing, stabbing him over and over in this frenzy all over his chest, his abdomen, his neck. Joanna Dennehy stabbed this poor man somewhere in the region of 30 times. I don't know what was different about this one, about this attack on John Rogers that made it 10 times more violent than the last one. And Mark Lloyd just remembered watching from the car feeling so helpless to do anything. Remember, I think the doors were locked and he's just watching thinking, I've just witnessed a murder. Joanna Dennehy has just murdered this innocent man walking his dog right in front of my eyes. He thought that there was no way that this man could possibly have survived the attack that Joanna just did because like I said, she was frenzied. She was not gonna stop. When Joanna was finally satisfied with her attack, she actually grabbed John Rogers' dog that he was walking that day and took it to the car with her. And they sped off again in this getaway car. When she jumped in the car, once again, she turned to Gary Stretch and said, that was nice, that was nice. I wanna do some more. And then they just sped off, leaving a second victim bleeding out on the road. And there was no one around this time. There was no one to help John Rogers. But he somehow managed after over 30 stab wounds, think about how much this man must have been bleeding at this point in time, how much his physical strength is just depleted. He managed to get himself up on all fours and crawl for a hundred yards until he reached a person walking by. This person called him an ambulance, an air ambulance actually, and he was airlifted to hospital treated for his wounds and John Rogers survived. Incredibly, he survived 30 stab wounds. It was found that both of his lungs had been punctured by the knife and they'd both collapsed and somehow he survived this. His bowel had also been pierced and left exposed. He was that badly torn up. Nine of his ribs were broken 
And again, it was a miracle that none of his nerves had been severed and that he wasn't paralyzed. Not to mention his hands and arms that were just covered in self-defense wounds. He desperately tried to fight off his attacker, but there was just something about Joanna. When she got into these massive rages, she had this like superhuman strength. Both of these men, Robin Baretza and John Rogers, survived their attacks physically, but they were left with so many lasting health conditions, not to mention the psychological damage that comes along with something like this. And John Rogers actually was a musician. He played all sorts of different instruments, guitar, everything. He was such a passionate musician. He wanted to make it his career, but following this attack, he could never play guitar again. His fingers just didn't move like that anymore. He must have sustained some level of nerve damage from this. Which I can't imagine how crushing that would be to not have only gone through this whole ordeal and for it to have left you with so many physical and psychological conditions, but also for it to take away your passion as well. It just feels like every corner of his life was taken by Joanna Dennehy that day in a split second. Just from Gary Stretch pointing him out on the road, Joanna jumped out of the car and within 30 seconds, this guy's life was drastically different. But anyway, now Joanna Dennehy is back in that getaway car with Gary Stretch and Mark Lloyd and she's looking for another victim. But by now, the police are closing in on this trio. Remember, they had the license plate of this car, they'd been tracking it all over the UK. And because on this day they'd been stopping in so many different places for her to go and attack those two men, they stopped at Mark Lloyd's house. These stops along the way had allowed police to catch up with them. And now Mark Lloyd said, as soon as Joanna jumped in the car after stabbing John Rogers, he could hear the sirens. Those police cars were getting closer and closer. Mark remembered thinking, if I can hear those sirens, so can Joanna and Gary. And if Joanna wants to kill one last person before police catch her, then it's gonna be me. But luckily, Mark Lloyd would keep his life that day because police actually caught up with the car just a couple of hundred meters away from where Joanna had stabbed John Rogers. It was on a little high street of shops. And as soon as Gary Stretch saw the police in his mirror approaching them from behind, he stopped the car, slammed on the brakes, jumped out and ran. He actually successfully got away from police in that moment, leaving Joanna Dennehy and Mark Lloyd in that car, along with John Rogers' dog. So all of these police cars surrounded the getaway car. They were coming out with their weapons drawn. All of them were armed. They approached Joanna Dennehy in her car where she was still holding that knife that had blood all over it. The same knife that she thinks she's just murdered two people with. Officers stood outside the car and asked her to drop the knife, which surprisingly she did straight away. She had no problem with it. She just put it down. In fact, she was very cooperative with police throughout this whole thing. They arrested her then and there on the spot, put her in the back of a police car, took her to the police station, and she was just fine. She was calm. She was relaxed. In fact, the officers said it was really eerie, actually, when they knew what she'd been doing, but she was just so calm and cool, she didn't care. I think she knew that there was no point protesting anymore. There was nothing else she could do. It was over. All of this was over. And so she might as well just go easy. So police took Joanna Dennehy back to the police station. I think they found Gary Stretch literally within a matter of hours. I don't think he got very far. And one of the first things they did with Joanna when they took her back to the station was inform her parents where she was and why she was there at the police station. And let me tell you, they were horrified. Bear in mind, this is the first they've heard of their daughter in over a decade. She left the house when she was 14 years old. Now she's 30 and she's barely been in contact with them since. They had no idea where she was, what she was up to, what her life was like now. And this is the first thing they're hearing of their daughter in over a decade, that she's up for murder and two counts of attempted murder as well. It was just such a shock because like I said, Joanna came from a very nice, normal family. Her sister turned out fine. Her parents turned out fine. So what was it about Joanna? Anyway, she's in the police station and they take her to the front desk so that she can give them all her information. They can fill out all these forms. And while she's there, this woman 
has the nerve to be stood there flirting with all of the police officers. Because remember, this kind of thing turned her on. All this fear and blood and pain and gore and violence and aggression, it got her excited. Her committing these two attempted murders had turned her on. And now she's standing there in the police station. She's laughing, she's smiling, she's running her hand through her hair. She's complimenting the police officers on their appearance and the way that they're handling her. She's also just very jovial and playful in general with these officers. She's saying like, oh, attempted murder and murder. Could be worse, I could be big, fat and ugly. In fact, she actually made a very racist comment along with that joke, which of course will not be repeated on this channel, but I did just wanna let you know that she said it just so that you know what kind of person Joanna Dennehy he is. She also asked one of the police officers that she was stood there with, would you be cheery if you were up for attempted murder and murder? And he said, no, I wouldn't, but, and she just cut him off there and said, no, but I'm still smiling. Joanna just loved being the center of attention every chance she got. And she was very natural with it right now. Honestly, if you didn't know that she'd just committed murder and attempted murder, two lots of attempted murder in that same day, you wouldn't believe it from looking at her because she just looks and acts so normal. So anyway, they finished up doing all these documents and stuff and Joanna was walked back down to her holding cell by some officers as she sang Singing in the Rain. But this case was far from over. Yes, police had detained Joanna Dennehy, but there is so much more to talk about here. For example, her missing housemate, John Chapman. And of course, there was that mattress that was found at her house that was covered in blood. They needed to identify whose blood that was. There was still so much work that needed to be done in this investigation and the very next day, on 3rd of April 2013, Peterborough Police received a phone call to say that another man's body had been found just 10 miles away from where Kevin Lees was found. The officer that took this phone call was certain that this body had to be that of John Chapman, Joanna's missing housemate, because they knew he was missing and they had this overwhelming feeling that she had murdered him. She must have. And at this point, police were just waiting for his body to be found. And it seemed that was what had happened. So the officer put the phone down and he went to inform all of his other colleagues that this body had been found when the phone rang again, before he could even leave the room. So he went back over, picked the phone back up. The operator on the other end of the phone said, are you aware of the body that's been found in this ditch? And this officer said, yeah, I literally just got the call. I'm about to get to work on it now. And the operator said, well, it's actually not just one body. There's two bodies in this ditch, two male bodies. Now this very much shocked the police. They knew that John Chapman was missing, but they weren't expecting to find any other victims of Joanna Dennehy's. They weren't aware of any other missing men. They, this was just such a surprise. And it was also terrifying because if Joanna had another victim that was there in that ditch, then how many more were there? So both of the bodies were recovered from that ditch and they were taken to the morgue. And sure enough, the first one was identified as John Chapman. John's cause of death was from five stab wounds to the chest, just like Kevin Lee. That is the exact same method of killing as Kevin Lee. Two of these stab wounds had been so deep that they pierced his heart and it had actually been so forceful that it had broken his breastbone as well. He also sustained one more stab wound to the neck which sliced through his carotid artery. So even if he hadn't died from being stabbed in the heart twice, this would have killed him as well. He had no chance of survival. And the other body that was found, this other male body, had the exact same cause of death, stab wounds to the chest, and his heart was pierced all the same as the previous two victims. But who was he? Who was this second victim? I don't know how the police did this, but soon enough, they had an identification. This man was 31-year-old Polish national, Lukasz Slabazewski. And interestingly enough, Lukasz's autopsy came back that he'd actually been dead for nearly two weeks, making him Joanna Dennehy's first victim. But police had no idea that he was even missing. The reason being because Lucas didn't actually have any family that lived anywhere near him. His family lived dotted around the whole UK, but none in Peterborough. So there was no one to really notice that he was gone. All of his friends were very seedy characters within like drugs and crime kind of scenes and circles. So it made sense that no one had actually reported him missing. And so police didn't even know that they were looking for his body for two weeks. Lukas Slabazewski's body had just been laid in that ditch 
decomposing for the last two weeks and no one had any idea. But what was his connection to Joanna Dennehy? Or was there any? So Lucas had been living in the UK for about eight years at the time of his death. Him and most of his family moved over from Poland in 2005. And like I said, they were dotted all over the UK. None of them lived close to him. He ended up settling in Peterborough. Well, I say he settled in Peterborough, but he was homeless. He didn't have anywhere to stay. He spent a lot of his time bouncing between hostel and homeless shelter and the street and he would just be in this cycle of like having a little bit of money so he could stay at a hostel and then he'd lose it and he'd be back on the street. And Lucas, just like Joanna, was a very, very heavy drinker, drug abuser. I think that's why they got on so well. Lucas spent a lot of his time in a local soup kitchen where it is believed that he met Joanna Dennehy a few days before his murder. It's believed that Joanna started flirting with Lucas as she did every man ever. <laughs> she was that kind of gal. And like I keep saying, she just had this thing about her apparently, that she just had this charm over men. Don't matter who it was, don't matter what she was saying, men were obsessed with Joanna Dennehy somehow. And Lucas was wrapped around her finger just like that. The first conversation they ever had, he was head over heels in love with her. Love at first sight. He fell for her straight away and Joanna loved it. She loved every second of it. She loved that control that she had over these men. She wanted these men to be so soft for her that they would do anything she wanted. He was just like a little loyal puppy for her. You know, anything she wanted. Same with Gary Stretch. Same with bloody every man she ever met. I think Lucas and Joanna did enter into a relationship, but it was not exclusive on her side whatsoever. This was barely a relationship for her. Whereas on his side, it very much was. And he was very, very happy. I don't know if he knew that she was still seeing other people. He actually texted one of his friends after a couple of days of meeting Joanna. And he said that life is beautiful now that he has Joanna by his side. But literally within days of meeting his new girlfriend, he would be murdered by that same woman that he adored so much. So the last day that Lukas Slabazewski was seen alive was on March 19th, 2013. Around 1 p.m. he went to a cash point, got a load of cash out, and then he went and met Joanna at one of Kevin Lee's properties. It's believed that she actually lured him to the address at Rolleston Garth that day on the premise of having sex. As soon as he arrived, the two of them started drinking heavily. And once they were drunk, Joanna suggested to Lucas that they should play a game. And so she blindfolded him and led him into the bathroom. Is expecting a good time right now with his girlfriend. And so he was more than willing to put the blindfold on and go wherever Joanna was leading him. But then the next thing he knew, Joanna had pulled her knife out and she began stabbing him in the chest over and over and over. I think Lucas actually tried to run away. As soon as he realized what was going on, he got up, ran out of the bathroom, ran into the living room, but there, Joanna managed to catch up with him and continued stabbing him. When Joanna was finally satisfied with her attack, she stood up and looked down at the body of her boyfriend, Lukas Slabazewski. And then the realization set in that she'd just committed murder for the first time. And she panicked a little bit. I mean, what was she gonna do now? She had this body, the house was covered in blood. This wasn't even her house. This was Kevin Lee's property that she just agreed to meet Lucas in. What was she gonna do now? So Joanna Dennehy called the one person that she knew would do anything for her, even dispose of a dead body. And that was her loyal sidekick, Gary Stretch. Because remember, Gary Stretch was like seven foot tall. He was more than capable of picking up a grown man's body and transporting it wherever Joanna needed. And he was in love with her, so he was gonna do it. Well, there's no record of him being in love with her, but like, I think he was. The amount of stuff that he just did for her and the fact that most men that came across Joanna Dennehy were like in love with her. So Gary Stretch called up his other friend, 36 year old Leslie Layton, and the two of them made their way to Rolleston Garth to go and dispose of this body. They grabbed it and took it outside and put it just in a random wheelie bin outside a block of flats and they just left it there. This dead body, they didn't even put it in a bag. They just put it in a wheelie bin. Anyone could have walked over and lifted the lid and seen this man's brutalized body in a wheelie bin. But Joanna didn't care. I mean, the body was gone. It was out of her hair. She didn't have to worry about it anymore. And she was on such a high 
after this. This was her first ever murder and she'd been building up to it for years. I mean, this violence and threatening people with knives and saying, oh, I could just kill someone. It had been years in the making, had this, and she'd finally snapped and she'd finally done it and it felt so good for her. And she was so proud of what she'd done as well. She spent the next couple of days telling anyone and everyone who would hear it. Well, anyone and everyone that she trusted that would hear it. In fact, she actually told this random teenage girl on the estate where she lived that she'd done this and then she took this 14 year old girl to go and look inside the wheelie bin where Lukas Slavazewski's dead body was. I don't think this girl ever went to the police and Quite frankly, I don't blame her because I bet that was such a scary thing to see. Like, this murderer showing you their victim's body in a wheelie bin, like, she would have been so scared that she would have been next if she'd gone to the police. But by then, when she showed this girl this body and she lifted the lid, this smell came out of this bin. And that was when Joanna realised she could not keep it there any longer. They needed to get it away from where she lived as soon as possible. So again, that night, Joanna Dennehy called up Gary Stretch. He came down to her house and they put the body inside Joanna's car and they drove it out to that ditch and they just left it there. And there it stayed for two weeks without being found. And then 10 days after murdering Lucas Slabazewski, Joanna Dennehy went on to kill again. This time it was her housemate, John Chapman. I think the two of them had been drinking together in the living room that day. Some people say that an argument broke out, others say that this was completely unprovoked. John was a very heavy drinker, very, very heavy. And his autopsy at the time of his death showed that he had a very high blood alcohol level. So high in fact that they believe that he was potentially passed out at the time of his murder. Or at the very least, he was incapacitated, like he couldn't move. He was very like zombie. So much so in fact that he was actually the only one of Joanna Dennehy's victims to not have self-defense wounds all over his hands and arms because he wasn't even trying to defend himself. He was that inebriated that he couldn't move or maybe he was asleep or passed out. Joanna Dennehy walked into John Chapman's room and just started stabbing him in his own bed. She murdered him in his own bed. That mattress wasn't hers. It was John Chapman's and the blood all over it was his. Just after 6.30 a.m. the following morning, Gary Stretch received another phone call from Joanna Dennehy. Actually, I think she called him off of John Chapman's phone. Her exact words to Gary Stretch was, oops, I did it again. Once again, she was asking for help disposing of a body. She'd murdered a second victim and Gary was gonna help her once again. And within an hour, the group had congregated once again in John Chapman's bedroom this time. And this group consisted of Joanna Dennehy, Gary Stretch and Leslie Layton. And Leslie actually took the time to get out his phone and snap a picture of John Chapman's dead body laying on the bed with blood all over him, stab wounds all over him. For some reason, this guy wanted a memory on his phone. The group then went to a friend's house named Robert Moore and asked if they could borrow a big tarpaulin. I don't think he asked any questions. He just gave them the tarpaulin. They took it back to the house, wrapped John Chapman's body in it, then put his body in the car and drove him out where they eventually disposed of his body in that same ditch where Lucas's body lay decomposing. Now, police actually believe John Chapman's murder was premeditated. They don't think Joanna just did this in a spur of the moment thing because it was later revealed that John and Joanna didn't exactly get on. It's not like they were feuding. They weren't enemies by any means, but they just kind of got on each other's nerves from time to time. John Chapman would often refer to Joanna as the mad woman. And he'd actually confided in one of his friends that Joanna had once said to him that she would get him out of the house by any means. So was this her means of getting rid of him? Joanna actually tried to tell someone one time that the reason she killed John Chapman was because he came in the bathroom and stared at her while she was showering. Although no one believes this is true. The investigators, no one. But anyway, now Joanna Dennehy has committed two murders in the last 10 days and now she's got a taste for it. In fact, she actually described it as Moorish. And that same evening, she decided that she wanted to kill again. The same day that she killed John Chapman. And she knew the perfect victim. Her landlord, 
Kevin Lee. That same night, Joanna texted Kevin and asked if he wanted to meet up for sex at one of his properties, and he said yes. In fact, he'd actually bought Joanna a gift, and so this was perfect. He wanted to see her and give her it anywhere. And this gift was a black sequin dress. The same black sequin dress that his body was later found in, in that ditch. So they met up at one of Kevin's vacant properties and they started getting it on and whatever. And then Joanna suggested to Kevin that he should put on the sequin dress that he bought her, like as a sexual thing. Like I said, Joanna really liked to humiliate her partners. And I think this was part of that, like dressing him up in women's clothes to humiliate him. And again, Kevin was very intrigued in Joanna's fetishes and kinks and things like that. And so he was down to try it. He was very interested in her. So he put this dress on, but within moments, Joanna Dennehy had got out her knife once again. Joanna launched herself and stabbed Kevin Lee five times in the heart. And when she was done, she called her trusty sidekick, Gary Stretch. This time they put the body in Joanna's car and drove him out to a different ditch. It's not clear why they changed locations, but they did and they put Kevin in a separate ditch 10 miles away from the other two bodies. And this time Joanna had actually positioned the body. Like I said, she posed him in a way that would be humiliating for him when he was found. She positioned him on all fours, face down in the mud. She hiked his dress up over his waist to reveal all of his bottom half. The two of them then drove back to the property where Joanna had murdered Kevin because Kevin had gone there in his car. So now his car was just waiting outside that property. They knew they needed to get rid of it. So they drove it out to this random field in the middle of nowhere and set it on fire. And then the very next day, it was found. Once they dropped off the car and set it on fire, Joanna and Gary didn't really know what to do and they didn't want to go back to their own homes. So instead they went back to that friend, Robert Moore's house, the guy that they borrowed the tarpaulin off to wrap John Chapman's body in. And they sat there in Robert's house and they told him everything. They told him about all of Joanna's murders, about how they disposed of the bodies, about how they burnt out Kevin Lee's car. And the thing was, Joanna knew that she could trust Robert Moore with this information because surprise, surprise, he was in love with her. Every man was in love with this woman, why? Of course he wasn't gonna go and give her into the police because he loved her. So now Robert Moore was just sitting there with all of this information. The next day, the two of them left Robert Moore's house and that was when they went on the run together. They were driving for days and days and days. They committed those two attempted murders together and finally they were apprehended. Joanna Dennehy appeared in court of November that same year, 2013, and she was charged with so, so many things, but most notably, of course, she was charged with three murders and two attempted murders. In the run up to the trial, Joanna had been telling her legal team she was gonna plead not guilty. I don't know how and why, I don't know if they were gonna try and get her some sort of plea or like a insanity plea. But when that day came for Joanna to stand there in the dock and give her plea, she pled guilty, which was a surprise to everyone. And psychologists have said that maybe this was Joanna's one last attempt of having control of the situation. She was in control in that moment. She was in control of her plea. That was the last thing she was ever gonna have control of because she was going right to prison. In February of 2014, Joanna Dennehy was sentenced to a whole life tariff, which is the maximum sentence you can get in the UK. That means she will never be released from prison for the rest of her life. And when she was told that she would never be leaving prison, Joanna just laughed. She just stood in the court and laughed. And Joanna Dennehy was actually only the third woman in British history to have been given a whole life tariff, right behind Myra Hindley of the Moores murders and Rose West. Gary Stretch was charged with three counts of preventing a lawful burial since he helped to dispose of all three of those bodies and also two counts of attempted murder because he is believed to have, well, believed to. He did facilitate the attempted murder of those two men. He pointed them out on the street to Joanna. He drove her over to them. And even after Robin Baretz's attempted murder, he kept driving with her and he kept trying to find another victim. So he was complicit in the whole thing. He helped. And one of the arguments that was used against Gary in court to say that he helped Joanna, he was a big part of this, was that he'd actually ensured 
Joanna's car, this getaway car that they were driving, and he'd actually insured it under the company name Undertaker & Co. Of course, one of the jobs of an undertaker is to transport dead bodies to their funeral. Gary Stretch knew what he was doing with that. Gary Richards, or Stretch, was sentenced to life in prison with a minimum of 19 years for his part in these crimes. Leslie Layton was charged with assisting with the murders, although he did argue in court that he wasn't the one that took the picture on his phone. Well, no, he had two different stories, actually, which makes me think neither of them are true. He said at first that it was Joanna that took the picture, and then after that he said that no, it was him that took the picture, but he only took it because he was scared for his life. He essentially said that he did it under duress because Joanna told him and he didn't want to say no to Joanna because he thought she was going to kill him if he said no. So then he just took this picture on his phone. This excuse was in fact rejected by the court, no one believed it, and Leslie Layton was sentenced to 14 years for his part in the crimes. Robert Moore, the friend whose house Joanna and Gary stayed at the night before they went on the run, he was sentenced to three years in prison, obviously for not telling the police everything he knew. As for Mark Lloyd, the guy that Joanna brought along with them for the two attempted murders, he actually wasn't charged or sentenced with anything at all. It was very clear to police that Mark Lloyd hadn't done anything here. He was literally just in that car because he was forced to. They threatened him to be in that car with them. And so he was just doing whatever he felt he needed to, to stay alive. And Mark Lloyd actually helped with the court proceedings as a witness. He gave evidence against Joanna Dennehy and Gary Stretch. So Joanna Dennehy is still currently serving time in a Surrey prison and psychiatrists have noted down that she is a pathological liar with psychopathic tendencies. Her own mother, even says that the world is a better place without Joanne in it. And I have a quote here from police as well. They say that Joanna Dennehy is the most dangerous woman in the criminal justice system today. She has no emotions, she will not consider the consequences of her actions and behaves in a way that is not erratic, it is calculated. And although it seems like this could be the end of the story, this is far from the end of the things that Joanna Dennehy has done in prison. That woman has been raising hell behind bars. Is anyone surprised? At one point, prison staff found a notebook in Joanna's possession detailing a plan for her to escape prison. Her plan was that she was gonna murder at least one of the prison guards, however many she needed to, but at least one, and then she was gonna chop off their fingers and carry their fingers around to use them to unlock doors because they had those like fingerprint locks on all the doors. Of course, Joanna was punished for this. She was actually sent to solitary confinement for two years. And for this, she actually tried to sue the prison saying that this was a breach of human rights and that it was inhumane to put her in solitary confinement for so long. I wonder if she realizes how ironic that is a murderer talking about a breach of human rights. Joanna has since written some letters out of prison to Gary Stretcher's ex-girlfriend saying that it was actually Leslie Layton that murdered John Chapman. I don't know why, I don't, that's such a weird concoction of things. Why is she writing to Gary Stretcher's ex to blame Leslie Layton for murdering that guy? It's just so many names. No one believes it, so I'm not even gonna bother getting into the letters and quotes from the letters. Just shut up, Joanna. But this is where it gets interesting because Joanna Dennehy has had a selection of relationships, girlfriends in prison, and you can imagine the kind of people that these girlfriends are considering they're in prison alongside a serial killer. Starting off with 25 year old Emma Aitken. Joanna started dating her when she was about 36 years old and Emma is actually a murderer herself. Emma, her father and her boyfriend were all done for murdering a man and burning his body on the street. I don't know too many of the details behind that murder. I might look into it at some point if you would want me to. Leave it in the comments below. The two of them met in 2018 in a prison in Durham and they dated for about two years, I believe. And a lot of people said that they were quite a cute couple. The two of them would go to the kitchen together and make cheesecakes and trifles. This this was during lockdown as well. I think they were still together in 2020. So most of the prison was on lockdown, but they would still like go to the kitchen together, sneak off to the kitchen and bake. They both actually made each other a cushion and embroidered each other's name on it. 
for each other. But the two of them parted ways in 2020 when Joanna Dennehy was transferred prisons and that was where she met her next girlfriend, Hayley Palmer. Hayley was in prison for an armed robbery. I think she was doing about 14 years in prison and a lot of people that know them, like Hayley's friends on the outside, say that her and Joanna are actually really good for each other. And to be fair, Joanna Dennehy has been out of trouble ever since she started going out with Hayley Palmer. Hayley made her promise that she would never attack or hurt anyone as long as she's with Hayley. And to be fair, Joanna Dennehy has kept that promise. She was a bit of a troublemaker in prison before this. She was always in different fights and stuff like that. But ever since she started dating Hayley, she's been quite calm and relaxed. But the two of them, I don't know what went on here, but the two of them were actually involved in a suicide pact at one point in prison. One of the guards walked into one of their cells and found the two of them entwined together on the floor in pools of their own blood. Ambulances were called, they were rushed to hospital, both of them were saved, and then when Joanna was sent back to prison, she actually tried to kill herself again and she was saved again. Hayley Palmer was released from prison just this year in 2021 and at the moment she's actually seeking legal advice on how she can marry Joanna Dennehy while she's still in prison. I think that's so interesting that she wants to marry Joanna knowing that she is never going to be outside of that prison. Her wife is always going to be behind a screen every time she sees her, like once a month. <laughs> Don't know why I'm showing you what a screen is. <laughs> As for Joanna Dennehy's children, because I know a lot of you will probably have questions about that. I don't know anything about the younger of the two, but Cheyenne is actually doing really, really well. She was informed of her mother's crimes when she was 13 years old. She's now in her early 20s. I think she's 21, 22. And she's actually come out and said that she thinks her mother should die in prison. I've actually got an exact quote here. She said, she deserves to spend the rest of her life in prison. I'm sorry to the victims. I can't imagine what they went through. And that is everything that I have on this case. Thank you so, so much for watching. I really appreciate it. Thanks again to Time Prince for sponsoring this video. Remember, they're giving away $7,000 in Sephora gift cards and all you need to do to be in with a chance of winning is download the game using the link down below in the description of this video. A huge, huge thank you to all of my channel members for supporting me and helping decide the cases that I cover, especially my tier two members whose names are all on screen right now. If you wanna become a channel member, you can click the link to do so in the description or you can click the join button if you're on a desktop. Thank you so, so much for watching this video. If you enjoyed, please leave a thumbs up down below. That would really help me out. If you want to subscribe, you can click this link to do so right here. If you want to subscribe to my second channel, you can click the clink as well. You can click this link right here to do so. And if you want to watch another true crime video, there'll be a playlist on screen right now. Bye-bye.